Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you all today is one that is quite the wild ride. It's a very intense case with a lot of information to go over, but at the end there are still a lot of questions and there are questions about the person responsible if he truly is responsible. So, after hearing all of the details, I'm really looking forward to hearing what all of your guys' thoughts are. But with that being said, let's just jump into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the brutal murder of Ildiko Kraniak. 48-year-old Ildiko Kraniak was the mother of one son who was born to her first husband. By all accounts, she and her husband had a cordial relationship and did what they could to co-parent and provide their son with the best life possible. She worked as a cosmetologist for over 20 years and was described as being kind-hearted, caring, and loving. She did everything in her power to work as hard as she could and make as much money as possible to support her family and send her son to private school. She was a believer that outer beauty is as important as inner health, fancying herself as a beauty prophet. I do believe Ildiko was born in Hungary, immigrating to the United States in the 90s. Now, I'm not exactly sure when Ildiko separated from the father of her children, but back in June of 2016, Ildiko was on the dating apps looking for companionship when she met a 59-year-old man named Stephen Beal. At that point in Ildiko's life, she wasn't in the best financial position. She had actually just filed for bankruptcy. I saw in one source that she had previously opened her own spa in 2006, but it seems that this didn't work out and that may be why she filed for bankruptcy, but we're not exactly sure. Meanwhile, Stephen, he was a widower. So the two met and were able to bond over the fact that they both had gone through rough times in their pasts. Stephen had four children from his previous marriages and had previously worked as an executive consultant for a few years before taking on acting full time. He had performed in a few magic shows before and had a hobby of building model rockets. After meeting, Stephen and Ildiko dated for a year and a half and over that time, they traveled all over the world. The couple took vacations to Cuba, Portugal, and Canada. And while they dated, they also decided to get into a new business venture together as well. They opened a day spa called Magyar Cosmetica in Elisa Viejo, California. Now, because Ildiko had filed for bankruptcy in the past, Stephen was the one who leased out the building for the spa. They started in one location, but after about six months, they ended up in a different building. They moved to the Mara Blue building, where Stephen put his name on the lease for the suite. During this time, Ildiko and Stephen also started another business venture together called 888 Unlimited, which sells high-end cosmetic products. Now, after a year and a half of dating, Ildiko broke up with Stephen, telling friends that she just thought he was boring. But after she broke up with him in January of 2018, her and Stephen traveled together to Portugal in March and then to Mexico in April of that year. Those who knew the couple said that these vacations were attempts from Steven to try to get Ildiko back, but others said that this was a sign that maybe they just had more of an open relationship and that Steven was okay with Ildiko dating other men, but in my opinion, I do think this was more of an attempt to get her back. But after that, in early 2018, I'm not exactly sure of the timeline of this, but Ildiko admitted to Steven that she was seeing another man and that she wanted to be done with him for good. But even after breaking up, they continued to be business partners. Stephen paid $1,500 a month on rent for the spa's space, as well as half of the operating costs, while Ildiko split the other half of the operating costs. It was said that Ildiko didn't always have the funds to pay for half of the operating costs, so whenever she was low on money, Stephen would loan her the money to cover her portion. And even though they had shared a business, it appeared that Ildiko was the one who worked at the actual spa and provided the treatments. Stephen did not have the skills necessary to work as a spa technician, so he really only participated in the financial side of things. So keep that in mind, he had no reason to be at the spa at any time because he did not work there 
only Ildico did. However, even though they were business partners and sort of had to play nice for the sake of the spa, those around Ildico said that Stephen became jealous, obsessive, and possessive in the months following the breakup. Clients and friends had noticed that Stephen had parked outside of the spa while Ildico was working and would just watch from his car for hours at a time. Then he would show up to the spa unannounced and try to mend things between the pair. Again, Ildico was the only one who worked at the spa, so there was no reason he should be showing up unannounced. Then, Ildico had confided in friends that she was starting to get freaked out by Steven because he was constantly monitoring her. Apparently, he would do things to try and gain control over her life as well. He had access to her online scheduling system and had all of the passwords to most of her work accounts and emails, so he was able to keep track of what she was doing and where she was going. By the weekend of May 10th, 2018, Ildiko had gone back to Hungary to visit with some family. That is how it was reported in most articles. However, a few sources state that she was also there with the intention of meeting up with a man who she was interested in potentially dating. I'm not sure. Either way, Ildiko returned back home and went to work as normal on Tuesday, May 15th, 2018. However, at about 1.08 p.m. on that day, Orange County police deputies responded to reports of an explosion that happened within the business complex located in the Marablu building in Elisa Viejo. When officers arrived, they saw smoke and fire coming from the first floor of the building as well as broken window glass and debris all the way in the parking lot. Of course, the first thing they did was to evacuate the entire area because they had no idea what to make of this situation or whether there were more bombs. Then they waited for the bomb squad to arrive, who got there quickly after. Once the bomb squad entered the building and authorities scoped out the area, they found partial remains outside of the building in the parking lot near a neighboring building, and then they found the rest of the remains inside of the building. Of course, these remains would go on to be identified as Ildiko Krenjek. It was determined that Ildiko had died as the result of the explosion. Then authorities noticed two women outside of the spa, which was located in suite 110A of the Marablu building, who had also been injured in the blast, but these women were still alive. These women were two patrons of the spa, a mother and her daughter, and they were only identified as victims two and three. Upon entering the building, they first cleared the area of any other explosive devices. Then they found that the origin of the explosion had come from the spa, inside suite 110A, near the front counter of the spa. They found significant damage to the exterior of the building and found that the suite's ceiling was blown open, so much so that the floor in the suite on the second floor had buckled inward. The glass from the suite's windows were blown all the way into the parking lot as well. Then, near the location where investigators believed the blast originated from, they found a 9-volt battery a cell phone, melted material that appeared to be duct tape, as well as loose wires. All of these items were very damaged and consistent with having been through an explosion. We do have confirmation that there was an obvious explosion, and that is according to the Orange County Fire Authority, what they called an obvious explosion. They also tell us the building was under construction, mm -hmm. but with hundreds of rescue personnel on the scene and first responders, it doesn't appear that they think that this was an ordinary gas leak or gas explosion. Okay, Mary, who is standing here with me, she's a San Clemente resident, was very, very close to where this all happened. Uh, she was on her way to an appointment on Marablu right behind me. So let's just start from the top, Mary. What did you see? So as I was driving up, about to park, I saw that the roof was on fire. Well, I didn't see the fire down below. It was all full of smoke. And then you heard, you heard all of the car alarm, alarms going off. And then everyone started running out of buildings everywhere with these looks on their faces of, of horror. And um, so I parked and saw two women come out full of blood, hair singed, just glass stuck to their hair, glass stuck to their, their bodies. Their, um, their skin was burnt and peeled back and they were just in shock. After that, they made everyone leave because they thought there might be a secondary explosion. Um, they weren't sure at that point what, it, what happened, 
and then they started getting all the toddlers out from across the street in the cribs. Now, when the women came out, were they in a building that looked to be under construction, or were they in a building adjacent to that? They were in the building. I thought at first, at first it was under construction because it was so, so disturbed, so broken, um, that they came right out of that. They were in the middle of that explosion. So two women came. Were they running out? Did they were they on fire? They weren't on fire. They were helping each other across the street, walking very slowly, in a lot of shock, um, shaking, just full of ash all over their face, eyes bloodshot, just blood all over. It's the second orange building. Okay. Down so we the, see a brick bottom. building here, yes. and then it's the one right next to it. And it's the lower corner um, floor. Okay. Now, like I said, victims two and three had sustained injuries from the attack, including severe burns and lacerations to their skin, but they were coherent enough to speak with investigators and recall what they witnessed that day. Both victim two and three said that they had been semi-regular patrons of the spa and had received multiple treatments from Ildico. They said that they really liked her not only because of her skill and her rapport, but they too were Hungarian, so they found connection with her because of that as well. In total, Ildiko and the two other victims were the only three people present in the spa when the bomb went off, so thankfully, nobody else in the surrounding areas were harmed. So now going back to the moment of the explosion. After receiving their spa treatments, victim two and three went to the front counter to pay. That is when victim two noticed a lot of mail all piled up next to three or four brown cardboard boxes on the floor next to the counter. Victim two said that she saw Ildiko pick up one of the boxes and then place it on the counter and then open it with a tool. Victim two said as soon as she opened the box, it exploded. She recalled that she was blown backwards from the explosion. Meanwhile, her daughter, victim three, had been getting water while that happened, so she had her back turned while the explosion happened, so she didn't really see anything. She was thrown forward, and all she remembered was being knocked to the ground before seeing everything on fire. Again, they thankfully survived, so they managed to crawl out of the building, sifting through the rubble and debris, covered in soot and burns, and waited outside for help to arrive. After this explosion, obviously the community was just shook. Police went to the public to say that they did not feel that this explosion was an accident, but a purposeful attack. But at first, they didn't know who the target necessarily was or why. They did assure the public that there were no further dangers to the community, but they still had a lot of evidence to get through before they could know the full story. The explosion caused such significant damage that they said that it would take over a week to sift through everything thoroughly. They were able to find multiple items that they determined did not belong in the day spa, so based on that, they felt that this explosion was intentional and may be the result of some sort of explosive device that went off. They also said that they don't know how the package was delivered because it did not go through the U.S. Postal Service. So again, they knew that it came from the box because of the witnesses, but they said that it was not mailed to that location. They also said that they searched the area for more bombs and there were none, so there was no further danger to the community. But again, they obviously still wanted to figure out who was responsible for this. At this point, our working theory is that this explosion was caused by a device. And although the damage was extensive, uh, there are some components that we have located at the scene of the explosion that are inconsistent with what one might expect to find at this business. Uh, we've collected evidence from multiple locations. Uh, we've conducted multiple interviews, uh, including interviews of the surviving victims. Evidence is being expedited to the FBI laboratory as we speak. The plane is already wheels up. As the investigation was going on, Stephen's new girlfriend, only identified as Witness 1 at this time, was watching the news when she saw the reports of the explosion. She knew that the building was where the suite was that Stephen was leasing out, and she knew that Ildiko was his ex-girlfriend slash business partner. So, she contacted Stephen and told him to contact the police, 
which he did at 3.30 p.m. that same day. Police arrived to his home shortly after where they conducted their first interview. At the time, Stephen told the police that Ildiko was his ex-girlfriend and that they had been dating for a year and a half and were also business partners. He said that the two broke up over money issues and conflict over the exclusivity of the relationship. He was pretty vague about this, but again, he said that they remained business partners. After this initial interview, police asked if they could do a quick search of his residence, which he agreed to. While searching, bomb technicians noticed a seven-foot-tall rocket, rocket-making equipment, two containers of potassium perchlorate, two containers of red gum, and at least three containers of black powder. Potassium perchlorate is a strong and common oxidizer commonly used in the manufacture of flash powders. Flash powders are explosive materials used to produce an audible boom and a flash when ignited. Red gum is used as a fuel and binder in fireworks, so explosives. In total, they found about 130 pounds of explosives and precursors within Stephen's residence. When asked about these items, Stephen told police that he had a hobby of rocket making that started in the 90s, but he hasn't pursued that hobby since 2004. He said that his goal was to build a rocket that could match Mach 2 speed, which is about 1,522 miles per hour, or two times the speed of sound. He said that he had achieved this goal one time in his past, so he no longer felt the need to build rockets. He said that he had also built fireworks and mortars in the past, but he stopped making fireworks after the 9-11 attack because he didn't want to give off the wrong impression. He said that he hasn't touched any of those explosive materials in his home since 2004. He said that he did see the media coverage of the explosion that happened at the spa, but he said that he didn't have enough explosive material to create an explosion of that magnitude. So based on his interview and the fact that there were explosive materials in his home, a judge granted a search warrant to search Stephen's home more thoroughly. Within Stephen's home, they found two cardboard tube items, batteries, a 9-volt battery connector, two handguns, a shotgun, as well as what we discussed a minute ago with those 130 pounds of explosive materials. Bomb technicians took those two cardboard tube items to inspect them and see exactly what they were. Each cylinder was hollow and about 7.5 inches long and about 1 inch in diameter. From one end, there is a 30-inch long fuse protruding. Upon testing, they found that the device was filled with explosive powder and determined that this was an explosive device known as an improvised explosive device or an IED. Basically, what that means is that this is a homemade bomb or destructive device used to destroy. So after finding these items with the search warrant and conducting this testing, police took Stephen into the station and interviewed him again. When he was shown the photos of the two pipe IEDs, he initially said that he had never seen them before in his life. He said that he had never made any bombs or anything that could cause a fire or catch fire. He did say that he built two small explosive devices, basically contradicting what he said before, but he said that they were a lot smaller. But he explained the location where he stored them, that this was the exact same place that the investigators found these pipe bombs. So obviously that pretty much means that, you know, he knows exactly where the bombs were stored, but he was denying that he knew about these bigger ones. Stephen said that he built these smaller devices in order to help a neighbor with his gopher problem. When questioning neighbors about this, they did confirm it. Stephen had built a small explosive device to kill a gopher that was in his neighbor's yard that was causing him trouble. But that really didn't give police the explanation that I'm sure Stephen thought it did. Rather than explaining the bombs away, People were even more concerned that Stephen would build a bomb and set it off in a residential neighborhood in order to kill a gopher. That definitely was not a good look for him. After searching through the National Firearm and Destructive Devices Registry, it showed that Stephen had not registered any of his destructive items. So, based on what they found in his home, Stephen was arrested and charged with the possession of unregistered destructive devices. 
At this time, his arrest was not connected to the death of his ex-girlfriend or the explosion that occurred at the spa. Now, initially at his bail hearing, a judge ordered that Stephen stay behind bars and denied him bail, saying that he was a flight risk and a danger to the community. But just a week after that, he was released from custody and his charges were dropped. I guess the prosecutors in this case filed a motion to dismiss the case because they thought that it was likely that the explosive materials in Stephen's possession might have been legal since they were used to build model rockets as a hobby. So Stephen was released and he returned home while police continued their investigation into who exactly was responsible for Ildiko's death. Now, like I said earlier, the bomb investigators found bits of wiring and a battery at the scene of the spa where the explosion took place. The battery was connected to a 2425 American gauge wire, and the extent of the damage to the wires showed that they were in close contact with the explosive device when it went off. So I think what that's saying is that the battery was connected to the explosive device via these wires. They compared these wires found at the scene to wires found on Stephen's homemade explosive devices, and they found that the wires had the same color plastic insulation and were both part of the same multi-conductor cord. They said that this type of cord is commonly used in pyrotechnic charge connections and for electrical matches and detonators. So they are basically saying that the wires found at the scene match the wires found in Stephen's own explosive devices. So they're basically saying that the wires found at the scene match the wires used in Stephen's homemade explosive devices. Then they found samples of different chemicals, including chlorates, perchlorates, potassium, and ammonium residues at the scene of the explosion. Swabs of the inside of Stephen's car showed matching chemical residues of chlorate, sulfate, and potassium ions. These chemicals are known to be commonly used to manufacture flash powders used in explosive devices. Again, in layman terms, the chemicals that would be used to make an IED match the chemical residue that was found in Stephen's car. Based on that, it is believed that Stephen used his car to transport an IED. After that, the police went ahead and looked at Stephen's cell phone data as well as surveillance video from the days surrounding the explosion. Just nine days before the bombing, cell phone data and surveillance video showed that Stephen went to a local CVS and there he purchased a battery that matched the brand and the voltage used in the bombing, as well as a cardboard box that matched the brand and the size of the box that the bomb was placed into. They also found that on May 11th at around 4.16 p.m., Stephen's cell phone connected to a cell tower closest to the spa. Then they found on CCTV footage from the street where the spa was located, so not necessarily, you know, right in front of the spa, but it was on the street that the building was located. This CCTV footage saw his car, a silver 2017 Toyota Prius, driving towards the spa at 4.24 p.m. and then departing from the area at 4.34 p.m. Again, as I stated before, during this time, Ildiko was in Hungary visiting family. So she wasn't at the spa. Investigators thought that this could have been the time that Stephen placed the bomb into the spa while Ildiko was out. Then police went ahead and spoke with the two witnesses who were present when the explosion happened. Now, they spoke with these two witnesses right after the bombing occurred to get all of the relevant details and figure out exactly what happened, but now they were, you know, more into their recovery and were more able to speak about other aspects of this case. So, witness number two said that she was a regular customer of Ildico's, getting treatments from her every two or three months. She said that in the weeks leading up to her death, Ildico told her that her boyfriend was jealous, possessive, and controlling. She told witness number two that he would threaten her and would randomly show up to the spa and intimidate her. While witness number two didn't know the boyfriend's name, she was shown a photo lineup and identified Stephen as the man that she saw show up to the spa and intimidate Ildiko. 
Then witness number three basically confirmed this, saying that Ildiko told her that she was afraid of her ex-boyfriend, saying that she thought he was going to harm her and said that he followed her around. Then, as I stated before, Stephen has access to all of Ildiko's accounts and passwords. He was able to track what she was doing and where she was going, but he was also able to see when she left for Hungary and when she returned. So it didn't seem like a coincidence that the bombing took place just the day after she returned back from her trip or that they saw his car going around the area of the spa while she was gone. Because if she didn't tell him that she was going to Hungary, which she probably didn't, he knew because he could track her with all of her accounts. So again, to summarize, because I know this is a lot of information, we know that Ildiko broke up with Steven and told him that she was dating a new man. We know that she was murdered by opening a box that exploded in her face. At the scene, police found a battery and wires that matched the wires Stephen used to make IEDs that were found in his home, and the battery matched the one that he was seen buying on surveillance video nine days before the explosion. Then, he was also seen buying a box that matches the one that the witness described seeing before the explosion. We know that Stephen had a knowledge of explosives and how they work. We know that he was said to be jealous and possessive and controlling. So, based on all of this evidence and these witness statements, by March 3rd, 2019, a little under a year after the explosion, Stephen was finally arrested and charged in connection with the brutal murder of his ex-girlfriend, Ildiko. The partially destroyed battery found at the scene had very specific characteristics that allowed investigators to determine the likely source of the battery. Further investigation revealed that Mr. Beale had made a cash purchase of a battery consistent with the recovered evidence at a store in his hometown in Long Beach only one week before the explosion. In the months leading up to the explosion, Ms. Krasniak admitted to being in a relationship with another man, and her relationship with Mr. Beale ended. Mr. Beale himself admitted to feeling betrayed. Ms. Krasniak told friends that she was scared of being harmed by Mr. Beale and that he had made threats. An armored vehicle was used to ram down the garage of his home to conduct a raid of his home, but he wasn't there. He was found using a bank ATM in the local area. He was arrested there and was charged. He was taken in and arrested at that time and was charged with using a weapon of mass destruction resulting in death and use of a destructive device during and in relation to a crime of violence. He pled not guilty to these charges. The first trial for murder started in June of 2022. The prosecution in this case argued that Stephen Beale, now 63 years old, had created an explosive device, placed it in a box, and set it to go off when Ildiko opened the box at the spa. The explosion killed her, injured two of her clients, and destroyed the building, sending glass and debris flying towards the neighboring offices and obliterating the spa. The prosecution argued that this was a case of infatuation, obsession, and control. She said that when Ildiko rejected Stephen and started dating another man, that is when Stephen realized that he couldn't control her. So, in a rage, he set out in a plan to destroy her. They said that his car was seen in the area and his cell phone was connected to that tower on May 11th, the same time that Ildiko was out of the country and in Hungary. They said that he placed it in the office at that time so that she would pick it up and it would explode when she got back. They also talked about the sheer carnage that the blast caused. Within minutes, investigators found partial remains all the way in the parking lot with the rest of Ildiko's body found inside of the spa. And again, they talked about all of the evidence that we discussed before. They talked about how Stephen knew how to use those chemicals. He knew how to mix them. He knew exactly what would happen if he mixed them a certain way. They pointed out that Stephen's model rockets weren't just toys that he made as a hobby, but were actually high-powered rockets that required a special permit. As we discussed earlier, one of the rockets was seven feet tall, and then prosecution showed another rocket that he built that was as tall as a two-story building. 
The fact that he built something so tall and nobody noticed before is kind of mind-boggling. I laugh a little bit because I just picture him building this giant rocket in his backyard that's literally as tall as a house and nobody notices. People just walk by and, oh, that's cool. There's a rocket. None of my business. Who does that? I guess Stephen does. Either way, the prosecution argued that all of this showed that Stephen was the only one who could have been responsible. He had the means, the knowledge, the motive, and the opportunity. However, the defense said that the FBI were desperate. They were desperate to find the person responsible as soon as possible, so they got tunnel vision. They zeroed in on Stephen and ignored all other evidence and suspects. The defense argued that they started with the conclusion and worked their way backwards, which again, as we know, it's not supposed to go that way. They're supposed to use the evidence to lead them a certain way, not the other way around. They showed photos of the buckets of the chemicals that were in Stephen's home, all of which were covered in dust. They said that Stephen hadn't used these materials in years. They said that they weren't hidden, they were clearly labeled, he willingly let investigators search his home, and voluntarily submitted to over 12 hours of police interviews. They said that Stephen was actually in the process of remodeling his home, and that the residue found in his car could be from the materials he used to do that. They said that Stephen did not have any motive to murder Ildico. The defense brought forward two other possible suspects. One was a man who had previously had an affair with Ildico while he was married. In the past, the wife found out about the affair and she attacked Ildico. This man had a prior experience in the military, so he probably had the knowledge to make that bomb just as well as Stephen. So, he had a motive and possible knowledge of how to kill her in the way that she was. The other suspect was an electrician that worked as a maintenance man at the building where the spot was located, and one source also said that this man was the owner of the entire building as well. This man had keys to the suite for the spa, so he had access to place that box where it was found. They also said that the wife of this man, who was separated from him at the time of the explosion, had expressed certain concerns about him as well. They said that this man had sent Ildico uncomfortable and unwarranted text messages. They also stated that he had taken out an insurance policy on that building just months before the bombing to cover the building in the event of a bombing or other disaster. On May 15th, on the day of the bombing, there had been two clients who arrived to the spot before Ildico, and they found that the doors were actually left unlocked. They said that Ildico was very meticulous about locking the door, so there was no reason that it should have been unlocked on the morning of the bombing. The second suspect had keys, so maybe he was the one who unlocked the door and forgot to lock it back up after he placed the bomb inside of the spa. The defense argued that if police had looked more into these suspects, that maybe they could have found more that connected them to the bombing. But instead, they got tunnel vision and they focused only on Steven. They said that because he was able to build a bomb, that investigators just assumed that he had built that one and no other evidence could take them in any other direction. This trial went on for almost two months. By August of 2022, the jury went in for their deliberations. They actually deliberated for more than seven days before the judge in this case determined that they were absolutely deadlocked and they were not going to reach a verdict. There were nine jurors in favor of a guilty verdict for murder and three who did not think that he was guilty. So a mistrial was declared and Stephen returned to federal custody to await his retrial. The new trial started less than a year later in June of 2023. In this trial, once again, prosecutors argued that he was a jealous and possessive, scorned lover. They said that the two had a very tumultuous relationship, and once Ildico broke his heart and started dating a new man, he wanted to destroy Ildico and her business. They said that Stephen, now 64, was the only person with the means, knowledge, motive, and opportunity to kill Ildico. The prosecution stated, quote, 
the defendant became an expert in making highly volatile explosive chemicals and building electric circuits and fusing systems. The defendant knew how to make things explode, and he used those skills over decades of making rockets and pyrotechnics to build the bomb that exploded on May 15th. And again, they went over the evidence that we discussed all throughout this video. The defense also came back with a similar argument as they did in the first trial that he was the one who called the police on himself willingly and spoke with them after he saw the news of the bomb. They said that the chemicals that he did have were all covered in dust and haven't been touched in years. They said that the police ignored all other suspects in this case and discussed the same suspects that I mentioned earlier. The court had asked why, if Stephen was guilty, would he take no steps to cover up the fact that he had all of those explosives in his home? Why would he leave them out and allow investigators to search willingly, knowing that he had these items in his home? They said that it would be stupid for Stephen to use a bomb to kill Ildico, seeing that he had just left all the ingredients out in the open for investigators to see. That's pretty much what the defense was arguing that, you know, he would have been stupid to use a bomb and then leave all the making materials out for investigators to find. So there's no possible way that Stephen was the one responsible. After hearing the evidence and arguments from both sides, after three weeks of trial, the jury was once again sent off for deliberations. But this time, the jury came back with their conclusion much easier and much quicker. After only two hours of deliberation, the jury found Stephen Beale guilty of using a weapon of mass destruction to cause death, as well as other destructive device-related charges. For this, he faces a mandatory minimum sentence of 30 years in federal prison, but he has not yet been sentenced for his charges. He will be sentenced in November if that hearing goes as scheduled. We have breaking news. A Long Beach man has been found guilty on four counts for building and planting a bomb at a day spa for revenge. 64-year-old Stephen Beal will face a minimum of 30 years in prison. Investigators say he bombed the Aliso Viejo spa in a crime of passion, saying he was obsessed with the owner of that spa, his ex-girlfriend, Ildiko Kranjak, after she broke up with him. The blast killed her and injured two other women. His first trial ended in a mistrial, but he was retried and today found guilty. After his trial and verdict, the U.S. attorney, Martin Estrada, made the following statement. Using his expertise in explosions, Mr. Beale cowardly murdered his former girlfriend, permanently injured two other victims who were her customers, and risked the safety of many others in the area, including a daycare center across the street. That was actually a big headline in this case, the fact that there was a daycare center right across the street from the explosion. If the explosion was bigger, those children could have all been in danger. We've all seen, you know, when there's those little lines of children walking on the sidewalk when they're going from, you know, the building to recess or something like that. They could have been outside during the explosion and had all the glass flying onto them. Who knows what could have happened? All we know is that this explosion was extremely irresponsible and obviously not the best way to kill someone because you're putting so many other lives in danger and who knows what kind of destruction this could have caused. Now, in the aftermath of Ildiko's death, investigators started to wonder if there was more to the death of his first wife than they originally thought. Now, as I mentioned earlier, when Ildiko and Stephen first met, he was a widower. His first wife, Christine Beale, had died from falling down the stairs back in 2008 after a large piece of furniture fell on her as she and Stephen were trying to move it. Originally, the medical examiner ruled Christine's death as undetermined. Contributing factors to her cause of death were chronic lead intoxication as well as pancreatitis, electrolyte imbalance, and other undetermined factors. So basically, Maybe she was moving that piece of furniture, she had electrolyte imbalance, which caused her to become dizzy, she had pancreatitis, which maybe her symptoms were flaring up at the time, which also caused her to become dizzy, and maybe while moving this piece of furniture, she passed out and it fell on her. The report listed her death as mysterious, but they did note that there were no signs of foul play. Now, what Stephen did in terms of financial benefit after the death of his first wife 
is a little bit confusing. It's been reported differently depending on what sources you look at. There are a couple things that seem to be pretty consistent throughout, but the numbers are a little bit different and what he actually received are a little bit different. I'm wondering if some articles assumed that he received the payments while some articles are saying we don't know if he did. Either way, I'm going to explain this in the best way possible and use whatever information that I'm able to obtain across multiple sources. It might be a little bit confusing, but I'm just as confused. After her death, apparently, Stephen attempted to claim $21,225 in life insurance, but I do believe this claim was denied. However, I also saw in another source that he did end up being awarded $500,000 from American International Life Assurance Company of New York after he told them that she had died from traumatic pancreatitis after she fell down the stairs from carrying that table. I don't know how true that is. If he was actually awarded the money and received it, I don't know. Maybe he was awarded and he hadn't received it quite yet. Maybe he did receive it and was getting payments. I'm not exactly sure. But either way, as of right now, all police have said was that they are now looking into his wife's death again. We don't know if anything else came out about that specifically. If we find out more, I will let you all know. Something else I want to mention about financials is that in relation to his wife's death, Stephen is also scheduled to go on trial in November for fraud charges. Apparently, he failed to report $350,000 that he received from his wife's estate. He also apparently schemed to obtain social security benefits from his wife's death. So that's something that I will be sure to keep you all up to date on come November. Again, I think the $500,000 might have been maybe the scheme that he was trying to do. Not exactly sure, but I don't know if he ever received that. But it does seem that he got that $350,000 from his wife's estate, which he did not report. That is why he's going to trial. And then that other $21,000, again, I'm not exactly sure if that was awarded. It did say it was denied, so I don't know if that's what the scheme is related to. We might find out more about that come November. I will keep you all up to date on if there is any more information that we find out about that aspect of this case, but that is where we're at right now. So, as of right now, that is where this case sits. I know this was a lot of information and a lot of technical information as well. I, for one, had to do a lot of research to figure out what exactly I'm going to be talking about with all of this electrical battery and wiring jargon. This case took me longer than normal to research because it was really confusing for me trying to figure out those things. And I also just genuinely wanted to know how it worked so I knew how the investigation worked because I'm sure police had to do the same thing when they were finding things that didn't really... You know, they didn't really know what to do with it, so they had to ask the bomb squad and they were telling them about everything that they found. I wanted to feel like I was piecing things together as well, rather than just like reading it and regurgitating it to you guys to figure out on your own. I tried my best to explain everything I could. Maybe this stuff goes more over my head than you guys. Maybe you guys are sitting there like, that wasn't that bad. But for me, I thought it was a little bit confusing. I had my basic physics 2 class in college that discussed batteries and circuits, but as soon as that semester's final was finished, so was all of that information relating to batteries and circuits and anything related to that. It goes way over my head, not interested in it, but for this case, it was very interesting to know about. This is definitely an interesting case. It's also very disturbing and a sad case overall. I think that it is crazy that people can just have these explosive materials in their homes and it be completely legal. That is kind of bonkers to me, but I do think that Stephen is guilty. I think the prosecution is 100% right that he was jealous and possessive and killed her because he could no longer control her. I think that he was selfish not only for killing her, not only for destroying her business, but also having no regard for the people that could be in the spa and around the building who could have been hurt or killed. I feel horrible for those two innocent victims who are simply in the wrong place at the wrong time, who are just trying to have a little spa day with mother and daughter, who are seriously injured and definitely traumatized from what they went through. And obviously, I am devastated for Ildiko's family, especially her son and everybody else who knew and loved her 
It's just an awful case and an awful, awful way to murder somebody. With the defense's argument that why would he be so stupid as to leave all of his explosive materials out, maybe those weren't the materials exactly that he used for these bombs, so that is why he left those ones out because he knew that they wouldn't match to the bomb that they found at the scene. He probably had those other IEDs hidden. Those probably weren't just out in the open because they didn't find those until they conducted the search warrant. Those clearly were not something that he wanted the police to see. I do think that Stephen was kind of stupid with this, that he probably should have gotten rid of everything after he planted that explosive. He literally had four days from the time that he planted the bomb to the time that it went off, and he knew that. He knew that she wasn't going to be back until that Tuesday. He could have gotten rid of all of his explosives, but he didn't. So why, the defense might ask? Is it because he's stupid? Yes. I think he just didn't think to do it, or he didn't think that police would make the connection. I think that he thought that he was so much smarter than everybody that was going to investigate this case, so I think he was cocky and just left it there without any care in the world. Either that or he's stupid. I don't know. You guys pick. What do you think? But either way, that is all of the information that I have for you today, and now I want to know what you all think about this case what do you think about those other suspects? I do think that there is a case to be made about them, but at the end of the day, I don't think that they did it. But what do you think? Do you think that Stephen is guilty or do you think it could have been one of those other men? What do you think of that first trial ending in a hung jury? What do you think of the second trial being so much quicker than the first one? Let me know any thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook page. All are going to be listed down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week, stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!